Um, so uh, I work for Populous, as you know, and we often use this as our slogan, we design places where people love to be together, uh, which is sort of the fundamental uh, philosophy of everything we do. It is, however, very ironic in this our current situation, right, that uh, we usually think of this being together as a, as a physical uh, environment where where we meet and a lot of our projects obviously are stadiums but I think we need to widen how we think about being together and today is a great example of that that actually the pandemic has forced us to be together in in many different ways and uh, we are now looking at the variety of ways of actually bringing people together uh, that's beyond the physical structure Populous, we do uh, architecture, as as we've mentioned, uh, many of uh, large stadiums that you've probably seen across the world. One of the projects that I've been involved with most recently is the new Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Uh, but anything from uh, Wembley to, to Yankees to uh, T-Mobile Arena in, in Las Vegas. We also do a range of interior design work. So we do the interior design work for many of our stadiums and arenas, but we also do smaller uh, projects uh, that that's uh, ranging from retail up to sort of entertainment. Um, another important part of our business is that we do uh, master planning and event overlay. So this is not necessarily the physical space itself, but it's uh, the operations and how we can use existing urban um, uh, facilities, structures, uh, squares, uh, both for sort of um, uh, participant, participants and visitors to, to come and enjoy sort of major events like Olympics, but also sort of day to day things like a Super Bowl game or um, uh, various uh, NFL games like we've hosted in London, for example. Uh, we also have a strand that, that's dealing with landscape architecture, and that's actually going to be quite important, what I'm talking about later today, because it's often this area that's tying our buildings into their communities, like, like Andy um, mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and lastly, we, we do something called brand activation or wayfinding. So we have an overlay of our buildings or other uh, companies' buildings and also uh, larger sort of um, Olympic overlays where we work with uh, how you navigate uh, these areas. So it's, it's quite a difference when you're working with large crowds and often sort of all or nothing uh, situations that we are doing. So my background is that I'm a Swedish architect as well as a, a British architect. I uh, was born and raised in Sweden. I've now lived in the UK for over 10 years. Um, I, I grew up very close to uh, the sea in Sweden, a um, very natural environment that I sometimes miss, but I think it's, it's coloured a lot of my work that I do. I started by studying my undergrad in Sweden. And then I was approached by uh, Professor Sir Peter Cook, who at the time was a guest professor in Sweden. And he asked me if I wanted to come to London and, and work in his small practice crab studio. Now, I didn't know anything about London or anything about UK schools. Uh, and it really opened my eyes. I had a great year out between my, my bachelor and my master, and I really enjoyed working on projects uh, up in the top right-hand corner as one of the first uh, buildings I worked on, which uh, was then built, which is a university building in Vienna. I have been working for Populous for over eight years now. And as I mentioned, I was um, heavily involved in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, where I had a uh, overarching um, design guardian role. Uh, I was also project architect for the a little building called the, the Tottenham Experience, which is the, the retail part of, of the stadium. So it's a freestanding building along the high road. Um, I also do quite a lot of experimental and um, innovative work within the office. So I've been part of uh, doing a few more sort of uh, non-profit work, but more research related work on how we see stadiums developing in the future and uh, what our sort of typology might develop 
into, which I'm also going to go into detail more of today. And uh, the last uh, project here as well is uh, a big arena. So we we both do stadiums and, and arenas. So uh, I, I added that project because I think it's quite interesting to, to see an entertainment uh, model that goes beyond sport, which is uh, something that we deal with every day in our office. So apart from being um, or working at Populous, I'm also teaching. So I'm a teaching currently at um, uh, at the Bartlett School of Architecture here in London. I've been teaching for over seven years. Um, I, I started teaching at Oxford Brookes uh, University and I've throughout my seven years been teaching undergrad, so second and third year students. Uh, and I love that part of, of sort of my career. I think it's really important for um, for us to to really connect the, the professional world with the academic world. And I see a great benefit both for myself, but also for the students. I think we've probably hired over between 15 and 20 of my past students in the office. Um, and I really, really enjoy working um, with the students from their part one up to, to later in the careers. And I think the mentoring ship that, you, that you're doing is a great way of um, really connecting um, academia and, and profession uh, more. So I thought today would be a good idea to, to go back in history a little bit and discuss the typology that we work with and understand where we are today and, and what we see uh, tomorrow and the future be like. So. Um, many of you are probably uh, very familiar with, with large uh, historic stadia like Colosseum. Um, and I think it's interesting to see where throughout the years sort of big markers has changed how these buildings and also how our behavioral change has, uh, uh, behavioral change has sort of changed um, the architecture around stadiums, arenas and event buildings. Um, this historic timeline, which I'm going to go into the markers in more detail, uh, really show you that uh, from, from the Colosseums, which are historic buildings, there was a massive gap of 14th centuries, essentially, where none of these buildings were built, mainly to do with uh, Christianity's uh, uh, sort of influence in, in Europe, uh, but also the US. And then uh, really, the starting point for these buildings again came with the Olympic revival in 1896. So if we go back to see these historic stadium buildings, uh, they were uh, often designed in urban contexts. They were big mass entertainment buildings to serve the people of these urban environments uh, to make sure that they they had something to do, distraction, entertainment, that was their core purpose, which is very much uh, similar to today. Because also they, they were uh, driven by an entertainment and sort of uh, leisure uh, premise, maybe that's also why these buildings were then not built for 14th centuries. Um, in 1896, we saw the revival of, of the Olympics, which was, uh, inaugurated by Pierre de Coppetin. And uh, some of the original images for this was something that hadn't really happened at all. It was a, a global uh, re reuniting event, essentially, and something that we, of course, have still today. Um, then what we are seeing is that uh, more smaller um, local, regional, national events started popping up mainly in, in football uh, here in the UK. So uh, we often refer this to an engineering marvels uh, uh, generation where um, large, uh, again, urban often buildings, but perhaps also suburban, but highly knitted into their uh, context. So in this case, you have Huddersfield on the on the left, which is the, the Leeds Road and, and Tottenham Hotspurs Football Club um, on the right, which was um, uh, built in 1932, I believe. And they, they are buildings that are very much part of their community. So this is... Um, a community that's um, of the post-war post, post -war, uh, 
they they serve the the working class uh, members of the society and they are again a place to come together to watch and entertain yourself in the game of, of football in this instance uh, we then have slightly longer after, after the post-war, so in the 1960s, we see a move to a more uh, a typology that moves out to the urban fringe. So this is uh, the Dodger Stadium in, um, in the US. Uh, these are becoming satellite destinations. They are completely driven by this uh, new uh, phenomena of driving everywhere. Um, so uh, just to repeat, uh, the, the, what we're seeing here is essentially uh, a very much a, um, a, a move to driving to your, to your destination and to, to these large buildings, which meant that the buildings became disconnected from their community and their urban setting, um, which was a shame in many regards. Uh, we then see uh, a massive change in how we consume these live events from uh, the introduction of, of TV cameras, but also the, the sort of broadcasting boom, uh, where the live event suddenly moved into um, to anyone's living room. And this is a massive shift in understanding how these buildings work. Not only do they need to cater for these type of broadcasting, but it also means that perhaps the, um, the sole purpose of watching the live event is not sufficient for enticing the visitor because you can get that uh, same entertainment now in your living room. Um, one of the another milestone moving uh, forward in in history in the early 90s is uh, one of the first uh, stadium or this in this case a ballpark that was used as a uh, regeneration tool in uh, for Baltimore in this case this is a Oriole Park so this is uh, at the time a completely new phenomena where many of these uh, um, buildings were either, if they couldn't fit in the urban context anymore, they would move out to the fringe of the city. Whereas in this instance, um, they decided and they needed the injection of of, uh, of money into the city in the downtown of, of Baltimore. And, and the ballpark was essentially used to as a catalyst for regeneration of, of this uh, downtown town area, which we see today much, much more in many areas from the Olympic Stadium here in London to, to even Tottenham that we've recently finished. Uh, we then see a move, and I think this is interesting to, to start talking about today, obviously uh, sustainable design and sustainable, especially today on World Earth Day is something that we're talking a lot about. It was sustainable stadia is something that we have um, designed and worked with uh, for decades now. And um, one of our earliest buildings, which is the, the Sydney Stadium for the Sydney Olympics, took many of the ideas and uh, perhaps technologies that we're, we're using still today. Um, but the way we see the typology of Stadia has, has certainly changed within the sustainable thinking, which I'm going to jump into a little bit more detail shortly. And then where are we today? So today we're looking at buildings that are and moving more and more away from a single purpose, a single use. They are becoming um, back to, they're, they're, they're essentially moving back to being very much a, uh, a building that's knitted in its urban environment and uh, in its community. Uh, it's buildings that um, do more than one thing. Uh, in this instance, you're again seeing Tottenham here, which uh, has a, a sliding pitch and introducing two different sports into the building. Um, I'm going to go through this in all in more detail, uh, but it's interesting to see then from from this point where perhaps we're moving into the future. Um, these buildings being uh, able to do so much more than than the original uh, sort of sole purpose um, entertainment buildings. So. Um, when we talk about sustainable stadiums, the one of the biggest issues that we have is is how they are these buildings are, are used. So if we're looking at the a building life of of fifty years, which uh, many of our 
uh, buildings that we design today, not only stadiums, but any typology is usually designed for. Um, a typical stadium, um, most of the energy that's used for a typical stadium is what we call the embodied energy. Embodied energy is essentially what you, the energy you use for the production of the building. So anything from construction, um, you know, to, to transportation during that phase until it's opened. And uh, the energy actually operating the building is relatively low in comparison. Uh, and of course, the end of the life of the building is, is very similar to, to other typologies. So if you look at the, an arena typology, the embodied energy is slightly less percentage of that and the operational energy is, is larger, mainly due to that the arena can often be used for more events during the week. So it might have uh, two, three events during a weekend and even some events during the week. Um, but if you look at the typical office building, you see that the operational energy is much, much higher. So building the building is, is more worth it, essentially. Um, uh, therefore, uh, what you can see here is that to actually strive towards a more sustainable uh, stadium typology, the more building is in use, the more sustainable the building will become. So another part of this is, of course, how we're dealing with these large infrastructural buildings and, and dividing the use of them in what's permanent and temporary. So this is just looking at some of the previous um, Olympic comparisons here uh, to the Olympic Stadium in London that we designed. Um, we see that, of course, if you're, you're building a permanent building, uh, you're going to have a lot more embodied energy. And the more we can design in temporary overlay or temporary seating, uh, the more that embodied energy reduces. Uh, obviously, some also uh, would argue that, that it's not just the temporary nature of these buildings, but it's being clever about uh, the design of them. So the size uh, is an obvious one, but also being able to um, uh, reduce the, the type of materials, so lightweight, compact uh, stadiums uh, essentially are more sustainable than heavy and large, uh, reusing materials, uh, reusing components of buildings, uh, perhaps even being able to, to do um, uh, recycled elements where we can dismantle and then rebuild parts of a building. Um, uh, looking at what materials are actually um, sustainable to use. And this is something that uh, I know that uh, maybe it's interesting for, for students may, uh, in this conversation. We're looking at uh, novative materials uh, that's replacing concrete, uh, which I'm going to come on to some exciting work that we're currently doing. So ultimately going back to the multi-use and extending this use of the buildings means sustainable. So when we're looking at uh, sustainability in our buildings, we're not only used looking at the environmental side of them, we're also looking at how to make sustainable social uh, environments, how to, to make this sustainable economically, because ultimately if we can't showcase how a building is sustainable from an economic side, it's unlikely to become sustainable from an environmental and social side. So if you don't have one of these ingredients, the others don't happen. Um, you know, as much as I wish that the architect had a final say in all these things, we don't. Of course, there's other stakeholders like uh, clients, uh, governments, perhaps councils, etc. And it must make sense in all these three categories uh, for our buildings to become sustainable. So uh, the next part of the, the presentation, I'm going to break up in a more scale factor and, and show you how we're dealing with these stakeholders in various scales through the work we're doing. So the first one is the, the individual. Uh, so how does the, the individual uh, fan, supporter, visitor, uh, perhaps even the individual um, person in a community uh, uh, change and, and react to the buildings we do? How does this affect the neighborhood that our buildings um, are built in? And, and how does it 
our buildings affect and, and become flexible on a regional, on a national uh, scale, um, and then ultimately on a global scale. So one thing that's very interesting when we look at the history of, of stadiums and, and their typology is our uh, behavioural, the individual's behavioural change and expectations. So in the very early uh, football stadiums, the images you saw from, from Huddersfield and Tottenham where uh, the, the working class was very much coming to watch a game. That was the sole purpose and expectation that you would you would go to the building um, to consume uh, the sport and that was it. And it's a very much of a traditional uh, approach. Uh, baby boomers are expecting to spectate, to see a game and that would be um, sufficient in their expectation. What we're seeing now is, is Generation X, millennial generation, Generation Z, is, is much more looking to participate. Um, so uh, this, uh, these generations essentially have been growing up uh, consuming sports and events in a completely different, in a completely different way. Um, Jen said, expect higher quality of content interactive opportunities, i.e. participate rather than spectate, and the overall entertainment experience, which in part comes from higher awareness and knowledge um, and not short attention spans, that's that's often sort of blamed to, for uh, Gen Z generations. Uh, and this is a really important um, part of what we're now designing, to understand that you can't expect uh, to design a building that's only a sole purpose. Uh, visitor and the fan want a variety of experiences when they come to our buildings. So choice of experience is extremely important. Uh, that goes from the general spectator. So these are examples from the work that we did at the Tottenham that we, where we try to really understand uh, the various visitors and the choice of experience they would have. So you would have a, a, a GA, as we say, like the, the general fan, the supporter, they have very different expectations to perhaps someone in a more premium um, uh, a visitor, uh, to sort of more corporate club visitor, uh, hospitality, and ultimately the sort of premium premium of this. So when we're looking at designing buildings, we need to make sure that, that we cater for various experiences. We also need to cater for the idea that watching 90 minutes of football might not be um, the sufficient approach of, of consuming a game anymore. Uh, especially Jen said, is, is so um, used to being able to consume things through your phone, um, highlights much more quicker pace, uh, perhaps even more like um, a wider wider sort of experience of it in the sense that you get get statistics, you can read, you know, how many of us don't sit in Google while we're watching a game, right? Or while we're watching, uh, you know, any TV program, like we're, we're used to being able to get this variety of knowledge input constantly. So this idea of, of watching a game without watching, actually doing other things while you're watching is a very interesting new phenomena that we see in many of our buildings, whether it's like actually being in a hot tub while you're watching the game or you're experiencing almost like a uh, uh, another level of a sort of thrill by being in, in one of those cranes above a stadium or if it's a, a more of a sort of party deck atmosphere where you might see glimpses of the game, but it's more about actually being in an atmosphere, being part of a uh, of a wider sort of experience rather than just the sole focus on the 90 minutes or, uh, you know, whatever time frame it is, depending on game. It might also be that it's a more technology driven experience. So, uh, again, uh, going back to the statistics in your phone, being able to perhaps even participate 
or uh, uh, impact the game. So, uh, and, and really feeling the game. We've seen a lot of technology today that either uses an overlay, so the, from the Google uh, goggles, where uh, you might be able to simultaneously watch a game, but then getting the statistics in one filter in, in front of your eyes, as well as uh, sort of a tactility or a sense. There's um, there's technology now uh, exploring uh, wearable tech. So you might uh, imagine a player being able to wear a, a top that um, that that uh, essentially um, monitors the heartbeat. That that heartbeat is then. Uh, you know, driven out to the spectator in one or another form that you can feel the this player's heartbeat physically in your own seat. So you're directly connected to uh, the individual on the pitch. So for the general spectator, the, the science of atmosphere, I think, is still something that is going to be extremely important. Um, we uh, we see that the sort of sense of community within the building is extremely important. And therefore, the, the senses that we use to experience this atmosphere, so whether it being sound or the vibration of the heartbeat, uh, is becoming uh, more and more sort of something that we are we're striving to, to really enhance and uh, amplify in our buildings. So... Uh, for Tottenham, for example, we we used uh, we work uh, with other companies that are specialising in this. So in this case, we work with a company called Vanguardia, who are um, experts within in sound and uh, noise and being able to amplify the fans chanting here was um, one of the main purposes of, of the sort of shape and form of, of the roof and the building to really get that um, uh, football uh, experience to the max. Unfortunately, those those uh, things are always very difficult to show in presentations because you you never you need to be there, and that's I guess one of the purposes for this. Because how can we compete with with being in sitting at home in your sofa? The the live experience still needs to be, uh, uh, you know, always enhanced to be able to be that just that little better than uh, perhaps experiencing it in your phone or even in sort of an immersed VR world. So the next part of going from the individual to the neighbourhood is uh, going back to, to this idea of the buildings being very much um, integrated in an urban uh, context, knitted into a smaller grain. You know, there's no denying that these buildings, as you can see in this, this image here, are aliens and they're often explained as aliens and large scale sort of um, uh, structures that are, that are planted into uh, these communities. But the important thing is not to actually see this from the aerial view. The important thing is to, to see how this actually can take shape and being truly knitted into the context on a um, on a sort of pedestrian level. So something that we work with in many of our projects is how we actually uh, connect and make uh, the, the ground floor of the stadium as active as possible. And this is going back to, to the multi-use of the stadiums. So the, the idea that these stadiums have um, uh, everyday activity, not just a football, but there is other layers in the building. So whether that might be cafes that can open up on a non-match day or uh, microbreweries, as in this Tottenham case, to um, perhaps hotel facilities, conferencing facilities. There's a multi-use overlay that these buildings can really host and facilitate uh, to become much more of an integral part of their neighborhood and, and community. Um, some of the spaces 
might even double up. So on a match day, they're used for the fans, but on a non-match day, they're used for the community uh, as parks and, and urban spaces. A project that we are uh, is currently under construction is, is a new stand for Fulham, the Riverside stand, which very much uh, is working on this concept. So the essence of the club really is that the, the non-event day is as important as the match day, if not even more important. So the building hosts a series of, of various use from um, uh, sort of apartments to uh, uh, more um, sort of public uh, spaces like gyms, hotels, spas. But the most important thing perhaps is the, uh, the broad walk that we see. Let's see if I, there we go. Uh, the broad walk that we see connecting along the, the side, along Fulham. So we're essentially creating a new uh, passageway along River Thames that's not existing today to really make sure that the building opens up for the neighbourhood and the neighbourhood and the community can use parts of the buildings when it's non-match day. The, to also look at the multi-use and what it gives on a wider scale is that the more these buildings become flexible, um, the more uh, we're actually extending the longevity and the need for refurbishing or uh, altering these buildings, which ultimately also is a sustainable way of thinking. So one of the early projects we did here in that sense was uh, the new uh, roof for Wimbledon, which does mean that you can use a building in, um, in a wider uh, context. And here on Tottenham again, we worked with a company called SCX, which uh, specializes in moving, um, moving engineering. So populace and architects in general often work uh, very, very closely with engineers to uh, come up with ideas to, to actually be able to, to push uh, the boundaries of what our buildings can do. So at Tottenham, we have two pitches. We have an artificial AstroTurf pitch that the NFL can play on. Um, and on top of that, we have a, a real grass turf pitch that sits in a tray and can be rolled out uh, when the NFL is there to play. So essentially, it's a, a true flexibility for the stadium, which means that we can increase the use. And we can increase uh, the amount of days of the year that the building is actually which essentially then leads to a more sustainable approach in the overall. And I'm going to skip through this digital a bit so um, uh, I'm aware of the time here. Um, this system was um, tested heavily uh, on a satellite site before we installed it in the stadium. And it's uh, it's interesting when you do completely innovative work, uh, the amount of, of um, planning and um, testing that goes into it, it actually um, was over a year of testing before uh, the final piece was actually built. Uh, it will take from us a couple of hours actually uh, to put together the technically So if we uh, look at a more global perspective and and what we are doing in our buildings and what we are actually researching uh, at the moment is uh, how we can use materials and innovative ways of uh, reducing our footprint, perhaps even uh, start being able to do completely carbon uh, zero buildings. And this is a competition uh, that's that a few people at Populous have done for a new site for Burning Man Festival in the US. Uh, it's called the Lagi 2020 Fly Range uh, Design. This was a competition that's still actually ongoing. We've been shortlisted uh, with, I think, nine other 
uh, competitors. And the interesting part of this project is that we're exploring to use a material uh, that's called ferroc, which is a material that's a actually negative carbon emission. So it's using recycled um, iron, recycled stone uh, to be able to uh, cast a new form of concrete. So being able to, to look at uh, ways of innovatively using materials that have the same strength and capabilities of concrete and steel that obviously most of our buildings are formed of, uh, we can perhaps push the boundaries and and be able to, to do projects in the future on a large scale that actually um, have a completely uh, like invisible footprint on Earth. Um, the, the other part of this is, as WHO sets out, is that healthy environments create a, a healthy population. And that's something that's very important uh, when we design our buildings to actually look at how our spaces can become more healthy. So being connected to natural environments, bringing in uh, green and the nature into our building, obviously not just in this case, but actually also in stadiums, um, is something that, that we're trying to push. Uh, I'm going to finish on uh, this image that we did in a collaboration with the National Geographic. And National Geographic came to us a couple of years ago, actually now, asking if you can envisage a stadium in the future, what would you do? And there is no such thing as one stadium of the future. I think there's going to be stadiums of the future, right? Like men, They're going to take many different shape or forms, but in this we image here, ultimately we try to combine lots of different ideas into one. So we started to look at a completely self-sufficient ecosystem, that the, the stadium were um, serving completely its own function, but also perhaps contributing to both the community but the planet overall. So stadiums uh, and arenas have the typology takes a large footprint so they do have the capacity to use things like rainwater harvesting uh, solar panels that's things that we see in our current buildings that we're designing but perhaps what we're not seeing is to actually being able to completely um make them self-sufficient so introducing complete waste um, management within the buildings, that all waste that's produced within the building is also being reproduced uh, for, uh, you know, um, used as, as perhaps um, uh, recycled and in the soil to create parks, uh, to uh, use the, and clean the water in the buildings, but also be able to store energy and, and contribute by uh, delivering that energy out into the network for the community. We were also looking at much more sort of technology driven aspects, holograms, being able to have uh, a much more flexible way of, of being able to to show and, and spectate by being able to constantly move around the stadium, perhaps in pods. Um, you know, we see drones being more and more used, uh, but also on a large scale, actually being able to inhabit them. Um, we were looking at how we can actually bring these healthy environments into buildings, open, completely open up the boundary between uh, the stadium and its context. So there's no, uh, no hard boundary between um, the seating, essentially, and, um, and the, the park next to it. So that we're seeing things like uh, hidden security, you know, we you can actually monitor uh, people without physical boundaries, uh, being able to actually open up the spaces. What we also see is that when you design healthy environments, good looking environments and environments that are um, pleasant to be in, you're also much, much more likely to get any troubles in spaces. So historically, we know that um, the, the away fans area, so visitors that are not necessarily in their home arena are likely to perhaps not treat 
uh, that stadium very well. But actually, if you design that space in a pleasant way, you're also more likely to have people that behave um, in a certain way. So being able to design spaces that are healthy and are pleasant uh, actually spur behavioral change. And that's something that you can see in um, in our ways of thinking about sustainability as well, that the more connected you are to the natural world, uh, the more likely you are to care about the natural world. So um, if you actually can see and feel, uh, you know, the ecosystem that you're in around you, uh, you're also more likely to act in a manner that that's uh, less likely, likely to impact it in a negative sense. Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it comes down to uh, a, a mishmash of, of opportunities and perhaps in, you know, tomorrow in the near future, we won't see all this coming together in one sort of um, utopia like this image is trying to uh, portray. But I think um, the, the importance is to, to take small steps and hopefully, you know, um, cultural change and behavioural change will push these buildings and other buildings in our society to become more and more integrated within our uh, communities and more and more integrated within the, the ecosystem and the planet as a whole.